Karangate po, karangate au, karangate koupapo te ranei e, e tai mana whenua, karangamai, karangamai, karangamai ira. Tuea ki ranga, tuea ki raro, tuea ki roto, tuea ki waho. Tuea ki te here tangata. Kā rongo te pō, kā rongo te ao. Haumi e, hui e, tāe ki e. Kē uku nui, kē uku rahi, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia rangi nui e tū i honei, kia papa tūa nuku e takoto nei, tēnā kōrua. Ki ngā mate, haere, haere, haere atu rā. Kia koutou kua tāe mai nei, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko ai au e tuake nei ki te mihi ki a koutou. Ko maunga tere te maunga. Ko rakahuri te awa. Ko tuahiwi te marae. Ko nai tuahuriri te hapū. Ko nai tahu te iwi. Ko Rachel Knight, a hau. Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Knight. I'm a project lead at Innovation Unit, where we develop new solutions for social issues and create impact at scale. I whakapapa, or have lineage, to the South Island tribe of Naitahu, down in the Christchurch area. But I grew up in the far north, in a very small town called Kirikiri. Growing up, I was largely disconnected from te ao Māori, or the Māori world. Um, I kind of saw it as something that was only to do with my past, that had no relevance to my present, and even less so to do with my future. Even two years ago, there is no way I could have stood in front of you all today and opened this talk in Te Reo Māori. So I'm here today to give you the courage to connect with the Māori world and to see the relevance of it in your work but also in your life. My wero, or my challenge to you today, is that if I can start my journey, so can anyone in the room today. I'd now like to introduce you my wonderful friend and colleague, Katarina Davis, who's been mentoring me over the past two years to build my cultural capability. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, ko maunga ki e ki e te maunga, ko wai te mata te moana, ko mahuhu ki te rangi te waka, ko rākei te marae, ko te tāu, te rungutu ngā honga hapū. Nō reira, ko ngā te whātua o rākei e tuake nei ki te mihi ki a koutou i te ata nei. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Ko Katarina Davis tōku ingoa. Kia ora tātou. Mōrena. Mōrena. Um, what a wonderful privilege to be here today. Um, I'm here on behalf of Innovation Unit and my organisation, Mauria Consulting, um, where I work to build the cultural competency of whānau who are working with our people, Māori. Um, a real passion for me is understanding the intersection between design um, and our world, te ao Māori. Um, there are many, many, many intersections and tensions um, however, why is it a passion for me? Um, I believe, we believe, Māori have been designing for generations. They've been taking risks, they've been making decisions without understanding or knowing the outcome for the betterment of our people, ngai Māori. Why cultural competency? Um, many of us here may know that Māori are always well represented in negative statistics, health, education, um, it's really important for us to help build our cultural competency so that we can engage with Māori in ways that resonate and connect with them. We have a responsibility as designers um, and we have capability as designers to shape the processes, the frameworks, the models that we use to engage with Māori in a better way. The way that we work with Māori, using Māori processes and Māori models, anything that is good for Māori is pretty much good for everyone. The title of our uh, kōrero, our talk today, is Ka Mua Ka Muri, and that encourages us to look back to Te Ao Māori to understand how we design solutions for the future. So we have to look back in order to move forward. 
How are we going to address this kaupapa today, this topic, is we're going to look at the four pillars that we use at Innovation Unit. At Innovation Unit, we're really, really committed to actively reduce inequality for Māori, and we do this using four PO, or pillars. We're going to look at how we apply these in a project. We're going to look at the impact that using these pillars has on us personally, as practitioners, for project partners that we work with, and for the whānau that participate in our process. We'll also take a look at potentially starting your journey. However, whether or not you're starting at the beginning or advancing through your journey, we really hope that we offer some value today. Little disclaimer, um, this is a really deep talk. <laughs> um, and we're only going to be scratching the surface today, so we really do encourage you, if you have any questions, any challenges, any thoughts or ideas, please take some time to come and um, talk to us throughout the duration of this conference and in the lounge after this. So, the four pillars, what are they? Whanaungatanga. The core word here is whanaunga, building relations, um, making whānau, getting to a point where we believe we're family, and that means making trust and rapport. Manaakitanga. So, the core word here is manaaki, and if we break that word down, mana and akiaki, it means to enhance one's mana but through process, um, mana being respect, power, dignity. Kaitiakitanga. What this means is taking on the role of a kaitiaki, or a guardian. And ako. So understanding the ongoing cycle of learning. We're forever learning, and we always have to be open to sharing and receiving feedback. The important thing here is all of these four PO are interconnected. They work over and over again, and not one of them holds more mana than the other. Another important point is that these shouldn't just be used during a project. They should be reflected within your team, your team culture, internally, externally, with the people that you're working with all the time. What well, I'd add to that as well is um, these PO, these values, they're not just relevant for working with Māori. They're quite universal values, and um, I think they're quite helpful just for applying to your work more generally to advance your practice, but also for helping you just be a better human as well. Um, like Dan was saying uh, before with his mindsets, these are very similar in that you might find that some come more naturally to you, while others will take a lot more practice. So, um, to demonstrate how these may look in application, uh, we're going to talk about a project that we um, worked on in 2018. So, Innovation Unit were commissioned by the Hart Foundation to help them understand how might we enable more whānau Māori, more Māori families, uh, to have a cardiovascular disease um, risk assessment at a younger age. To do this, we worked through a discovery phasal process. Um, <laughs> Uh, where we use key informant um, interviews, we looked at local, national and international um, information, and most importantly, we did an epic trip around the far north, um, Te Tai Tokero, uh, and held a whole heap of empathy interviews with whānau up there. And to understand what these pose look like in application again, um, we're going to be breaking them down um, po by po. So, whanaungatanga, as I said earlier, that's about understanding the importance of relationships. Um, for us, that looks like maintaining our already existing relationships without intention. So, not just um, calling on the relationship when we need it for a project, but maintaining those relationships right through from beginning to end with, without intention. What this looked like for this project, this person here is one of our good friends from uh, Panguru. And if you have been up to this coast before, you will understand how inaccessible it is. So without those connections, those trusted connections to share his whanau with us, we would not have been able to achieve what we did. What I learned from this project around applying for Nonatanga was um, it kind of helped me reflect on my own practice as a, a researcher, design researcher, and it helped me realise that my approach to date has been quite clinical and very Pākehā-centric, and that I've always kept kind of a safe distance between myself 
and research participants. The problem with that approach is that you can also distance yourself from the responsibility of creating change based on those conversations, because at the end of the day, you can walk away and you might never see those people ever again. What I found is that when research participants just become people that you know, there's a lot more accountability and there's a lot more personal motivation to follow through as well. So based on this, we have a Weddle for you. What is your organization's budget for cups of tea? Now the reason we say this is that we know that keeping relationships warm takes time, but it is an investment. So how is your team enabled to stay in touch with people before you need to draw on that relationship? Manaki tanga. So as I stated before, this is about enhancing one's mana or the respect, the power um, of the person. And what this can look like in a design process is using processes that resonate with people. So find ways that can connect with your target audience but within that, staying agile. For this project in particular, it looks like questioning frameworks that were based on Māori health models. While we thought this was a good idea, when we tested them, we understood that actually not a lot of people knew about Māori health models. And so it, it looked like us changing the language and using language that resonated. So in this case, people talking about the whakapapa or the lineage of their um, CVD or cardiovascular disease experiences was way more res um, relevant. Another thing around manakitanga and making people feel warm and welcome is not assuming how connected they are to te ao Māori. Sometimes if they aren't so connected, going in with a you know, mihi or things that are quite connected to te ao Māori can make people feel inadequate. And at the end of the day, that's the last thing we want. So, thinking about your own processes, um, how do your processes enhance people's mana? So, kaitiakitanga, guardianship. This kupu, this word, is often used uh, in reference to being a kaitiaki, or a guardian of the natural resources around us. But it's also really relevant for research processes as well, as well because in a way, you become kaitiaki, or guardian, of the people that you talk to, and also the stories that they share with you as well. For this project, uh, being kaitiaki ourselves, uh, meant closing the loop and making sure that we shared back what we took throughout that process. So we did that in a few ways. Um, the first was making sure that once we created some kind of research re report, we made sure that we shared this back with every single person who was involved in that research. We also made sure that moving forward, when we started to uh, design new solutions, we made sure that those people were involved as really key partners in that process to, again, make sure that any of those solutions that were created were really relevant for them. And then lastly, we kind of acted as uh, kaitiaki in the sense that we treated their stories as the taonga that they were, so the, the precious treasures, because some of these stories were really deep and really personal. So we took a lot of care in the way that we uh, wrote and presented their stories because we wanted them to be really proud of them. What we learned through this is that, uh, generally speaking, the benefits of sharing back information largely outweigh any risks. So the whānau that we shared the report back with we're really grateful that we had done that and it helped to build trust in ourselves as practitioners, but also in the processes that we were using. We were also told uh, when we made the report live on our website um, that some other designers in another organization used that to apply to their approach for a different project, which was amazing for us to hear because it meant that it was creating a ripple effect of impact uh, wider than anything we could ever do on our own. Mm. So, next widow, uh, what is your organization's commitment to sharing back people's stories? The reason we ask this is because um, we hear a lot at the moment, uh, especially with things like design research becoming so popular, that a lot of people, especially whānau Māori, are being asked about their experiences 
but they're not necessarily seeing what happens to that data. And that starts to break down trust, especially in design. Mm. Another way to kind of phrase this question would be to ask, why would you take someone's taonga if you know that you can't give it back to them? So maybe instead of worrying about worst case scenarios of what might happen if we make data more available to people, let's instead think of the amazing possibilities and the ripple effects that could happen if we do. Also within kaitiaki, um, kaitiaki tanga and as myself, as a kaitiaki of tikanga Māori, it's really important for me to uphold tikanga Māori practices. Um, and really important for me not to be picking and choosing what bits I like and taking it all the good and the bad. And if we are fully investing in tikanga, well, for a lack of a better word, it will pay off later. A lot of the time it's showing that we are able to engage with Māori in the way that it connects with them um, and we are giving the time to their mana. And therefore it, f it pays off by the trust and the rapport that we've built that will help us build um, much more deeper conversations. Ako. So Ako is an ongoing cycle of learning. It's, it's a cycle of learning that thinks about what am I willing to share and what am I open to learning. Um, this can be looked at in a concept of tuakana teina. So the tuakana teina concept is the concept of the older sibling and the younger sibling. The older sibling being able to teach the younger sibling the ways, the way to be, and the younger sibling teaching tolerance. <laughs> um, in this project, Rachel and I played both roles. So I played a tuakana in the space that, in terms of connecting to te ao Māori, was working to help Rachel um, be safe and comfortable on her journey. Um, in terms of Rachel, she definitely was the tuakana in the space of design research. So together, we were an awesome team. Um, one of the highlights for me in this project was uh, after we had had conversations with Fano across the far north, we sat down on a beach in Paihia and started to make sense of that uh, research together. And while we were doing that, we had some really deep conversations together about te ao Māori, the Māori world, and about design as well. And through that, I learnt it's cheesy, but it's true. Our strength really does lie in our differences. So if you know Kat and I, you know that we are very different people. We're like chalk and cheese, um, but it's amazing because every time we work together, we learn from each other as well. So, another wero, what are you bringing to the table of reciprocity? So in terms of impact, we talked about how we are going to share stories about what it looks like for us personally as practitioners, um, what it looked like for our project partners, and what it looked like for the whānau that participated in our process. So personally, as practitioners, it allowed us to have deeper conversations um, with the whānau, really deep emotional conversations, and what that enabled is for us to tell better stories that it allowed our project partners to have a much deeper and emotional response to what they were hearing. It allowed them to actually far out, take off their expert hat, open their hearts and listen. And what that allowed was a power shift. It was so powerful when we were up in Whangarei with a whole heap of whānau from Te Tai Tokero and noticed the power shift between the experts and our whānau Māori. And what it, that allowed for was them to realise their potential to design solutions for ourselves. Awesome. So we've given you a bunch of uh, provocations or challenges. Um, and now we want to help you to start your journey, if that's where you are now. Um, to help you do that, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my own journey. So it started for me really when I started this job at Innovation Unit about two years ago. And at the time, I was stuck in a pretty negative cycle that I think will be, uh, it will probably resonate with a few of you in the room today. To start off with, I was sitting in a place of shame. I was embarrassed that I didn't know more about our history as a country. I was embarrassed that I didn't know what it meant to work with Māori. I was embarrassed that I didn't know what it meant to be Māori. And on top of all of that, I was embarrassed because I didn't know 
why these things were important, or how they were even relevant to me, especially in today's age. Because of that, if I ever had any opportunities to learn or to try, I was terrified of getting it wrong. And so, of course, I would avoid those situations and then I would feel guilty for not trying and for not prioritizing. What I also found is that uh, to try and shift some of this guilt, I would kind of justify it to myself by saying, it's okay, it's not relevant to you anyway. Mm. And so of course the cycle continued. What happened when I started at Innovation Unit is that um, my discomfort was confronted by some really clear expectations of what the minimum requirements were for me as a team member in terms of cultural competency. There's a whole lot of different ways that they did this when I started at the job, um, a whole lot of different skills that were required of me um, based on a framework that Kat developed, but it happened even before I started the job. So the first time I even looked at the job description, it was outlined as a key skill that I needed to either already have or work towards to join that team. Then in my job interview, I was greeted in a formal mihi, or a formal Māori greeting, similar to the one I did at the start of this talk. And this showed me that uh, Innovation Unit took cultural competency seriously, that they role modeled it in their work, and that it wasn't just lip service as well. Then on my first day, I was welcomed to the team and into the studio in a formal pōwhiri process, um, which was pretty intimidating for me because I couldn't remember the first time I'd been to a pōwhiri before that. But what was really exciting was when we did a round of whakawhanaunatanga, or um, introductions to the team to get to know each other, Almost everyone in the team could introduce themselves, at least in some level, of te reo Māori, or the Māori language. This was amazing for me because it showed me that this was just the accepted norm of what we did. And it made me look forward to the next time that we welcomed someone into the studio because I wanted to be able to do the same. So by seeing those clear expectations role modelled, I was able to move on from that shame and move forward. As for my fear, that started to go away when I was given ongoing opportunities to learn and to try and to ask a million very uncomfortable questions in a really safe and encouraging environment. Again, there's a whole lot of different ways that we do this, um, but one is that at our weekly team meetings, we open in karakia, or we set intentions together, and we also finish by practicing waiata, or songs. The great thing about this is that we are all learning together, no matter what point of the journey we're on, whether we are you know, reading the words off a page, whether we're starting to memorize them, maybe we're perfecting our pronunciation or, or going deeper into the meaning. We're all learning together, and it's a really safe environment. So I was able to uh, move on from my fear and as for my guilt, this started to go away when I, after maybe six months a year, I could start to look back and see how far I had come on that journey. Um, again, lots of ways you can do this. I think one of the most important ones, it's really simple, and Kat is really great at it, but even a simple word of encouragement to your colleague, if they give something a go, even if it's not perfect, just letting them know um, that they did really well, it goes a really long way. There's other things we do around the office. We have a celebration jar where you can throw some confetti when you did a thing uh, that can make you feel pretty good. Um, but also simple things like having some kai, having some food together as a team to celebrate the learning journey all together as well. So I was able to let go of my guilt, finally. So if you're interested in starting your journey to build your cultural competency, we think these are some pretty good places to start. First of all, setting your expectations as yourself, as a practitioner, but also in your team and your organization. What are the minimum requirements that everyone needs to be able to do in terms of cultural competency? Hmm. 
Now, the only reason Innovation Unit was able to be so clear about these with me is because they'd already done the, the hard work in terms of having the really tough conversations around their commitment to this country, to the tangata whenua, so um, the people of this land, and also to the Treaty of Waitangi. So if you haven't done that already, that's a pretty important place to start. Also providing ongoing opportunities to learn and to try. What are your weekly, your monthly, or your yearly rituals as a team to keep learning together and celebrating growth? How do you recognize people, no matter what point in their journey they're on, to make sure that you keep inspiring yourselves and others to step up and to go further? We genuinely believe that if everyone in the room today did even one of these things, we would start to move forward as a collective and start to break down this cycle. So instead of shame, let's be curious to dig deeper and to learn more and to go further. Instead of being afraid, let's have the courage to give it a go and to keep trying when we don't get it right the first time. Then, in terms of, I've forgotten the last one, sorry, guilt, let's let go of our guilt and instead be proud of how far we've come and inspire others to start their own journey as well. So, in closing, we have three more wero for you. What is one thing that you might do on Monday to start or advance your journey? Secondly, please come and have a kōrero with us after this. Um, we're really looking forward to meeting you all, building for Naungatanga, um, and answering any questions or any thoughts that you might have. Um, and thirdly, in te ao Māori, in the Māori world, singing or waiata is a really, really great, great way to understand or learn about te ao Māori. So, if I could ask everybody to stand. <laughs> We're going to ask you to take part in a waiata, learning a waiata. And how we're going to do this is we're going to start off with a call and repeat kind of situation um, where I will lead it and you repeat, and then we'll have a go at singing this all together. Um, this song is a, quite a universal song, so it's one that you can put in your pocket for when you start engaging with Māori, um, and a nice simple tune for us to remember. So it talks of love, it talks of hope and faith, and it talks of peace for everybody. So with that, here we go. <coughs> te aroha, te aroha, te whakapono, te whakapono. Me te rangi marie. Me te rangi marie. Ta 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 ue. Ta 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 ue. Orgela. Te aroha. Te pakapono. Me te rangi marie. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Thanks, everyone.